Let me start by congratulating the Chatham House for its major accomplishment, which is not to be the center of policy dialogue on many issues. It is actually to have accomplished the export of its non-attribution, non-on-the-record to everybody else except to itself. <laughs> so I, I think that is uh, quite remarkable. It's exactly what my daughters say, so are you walking the talk or talking the walk? Um, but in any event, I am, uh, I am delighted to be here with you again this morning, and, and thank you again for your kind intervention, kind uh, invitation. I, I hear that uh, Connie was here before me um, and, uh, and talked to you a little bit from the EU perspective um, and was, uh, on the whole, a positive and optimistic. So I hope it won't surprise you uh, that I uh, am also uh, optimistic, I would say cautiously optimistic. But, uh, but before I get to the good news, let me start, unfortunately, with a uh, sobering note. Because the fact is there is no hiding from the fact that we are faced with increasingly compounded and compounding global challenges. And just to name the ones we all know, population growth, water and food scarcity, resource scarcity, energy insecurity, environmental depredation, and now uh, over the past few years, debt and uh, jobs crises. And as if that were not enough for us to handle, we also know that climate change can become an amplifier and a multiplier of all of the above, and that unchecked, climate can actually erase all of the progress that has been made in development over the past 25 years, in particular in developing countries. Not only could it erase everything that we have actually accomplished, but perhaps more dangerously, it could catapult us over an environmental tipping point beyond which our computers can't even model. Now, the developmental irony about that is that the only way to avoid that possible environmental tipping point is to actually accelerate the economic tipping point. So what we need to do if we're going to stabilize food prices, if we're going to guarantee water access, if we're going to re-stabilize energy security, is to move away from the environmental tipping point that would have us go toward the worst toward the economic tipping point that would have us go toward the best, toward the point beyond which low carbon living is the norm and not the novelty, and the point beyond which we would have created and cemented an economic and social paradigm that will support our growing population without depleting the planet. We are clearly not there yet, but I suggest to you this morning that the international climate change process is precisely where that paradigm is being created. And I also suggest to you that we're actually on our way. So where are we in that process? Well, to many of you, the pains and sorrows of Copenhagen are either still very alive in your memory or perhaps just in your journals. Uh, but Copenhagen is very, very well known to all of us. What is less known is the fact that the international climate change process has progressed more over the past two years since Copenhagen than over the past 10. That international climate change process has constructed a response that aspires to address the full gamut from cutting emissions to timely adaptation. It has constructed a new global infrastructure 
to achieve that. And it has added climate change to a very short list of issues for which a truly universal response can and will be made. Now, the Chatham House organizers have asked me to address three basic questions. What progress has been made since Durban? And what are the key outcomes of the ADP, of the Durban platform? What are the proposed approaches for enhancing mitigation ambition? And what alignments have emerged from the international climate talks? So let's take each of those uh, briefly. First, to the progress in the process uh, for all of you policy junkies, and I'm afraid there are quite a few in the room. Um, let, me, let me just say, after Durban, governments came into 2012 with specific objectives under three negotiating tracks. Kyoto Protocol, the long-term cooperative action under the convention, and the new baby on the block, the new kid on the block, the Durban platform. Distilled, those objectives under those three negotiating tracks are, first, to usher in the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol on the 1st of January of 2013. Secondly, to finalize the negotiation stage under the long-term cooperative action and move it, or I would say push it, into a very urgent implementation stage. And third, to move toward adopting a universally inclusive and legally based agreement by 2015 to start in 2020, and in the meantime, raise, uh, m m raise our ambition for emissions and support developing countries without delay. Now, those three objectives are actually aimed at closing three key gaps that governments have identified in the international response. And those three gaps are to close the red regulatory gap between the first and the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, to close the gap in the financial support offered to developing countries between the end of the fast start finance which is now this year in December, and the ramp up that needs to exist toward the long-term support of 100 billion per annum by 2020. And thirdly, to close the ambition gap before and after 2020. Now, since I actually went to school a couple of times, it, when I was very young and then when I was less young, in this marvelous city, I really can't resist the temptation to fall in London a, into a uh, academically inspired grading exercise. So from my perspective, governments get a B for good effort, but certainly not yet an A for achievement. Now, hopefully because they strive for an A, during this year, Governments have been making progress to set a firm base for their decisions in Doha. And let me summarize this year's progress. Under the Kyoto Protocol, and in order to usher a second commitment period, we now have elements of a final decision as they might appear under the Doha Amendment. We have a better understanding of what to do to resolve the differences around the length of the second commitment, five or eight years. Um, and we have, and this is quite a novelty in the climate change negotiations, we have a forthcoming negotiating text in good time for everyone to consider before Doha. Progress under the LCA this year. We have uh, progress to clarify the different views on long-term finance. We have better traction on launching the work of the Green Climate Fund. And this week, uh, the board is meeting to decide on the host. Uh, we have progress on new market-based and other possible mechanism. Um, and we have progress on how the review, the all very, very important science-guided uh, review is going to shape up and start in the 2013. 
progress under the ADP, the Durban platform, well, that is the new kid on the block. It is a very incipient negotiating track. Um, but we already do have preliminary ideas, bro both on the broad contours and architectural features of that new agreement, as well as first thoughts on how countries might deal with different national circumstances in order to shape an effective, fair, and ambitious agreement. We've also received many proposals, not just from governments, but also from IGOs, NGOs, and business group, on how mitigation ambition could be enhanced without delay. Those proposals, and there are many of them, reflect three broad approaches that are actually not mutually exclusive. One is to increase the ambition of existing mitigation tables, uh, pledges that are already on the table. The second is to increase the number of countries making pledges. And the third is to begin to recognize and quantify the supplementary actions or the international cooperative actions and initiatives that are being taken at subnational, national, and international levels um, and that are not currently part of the formal UNFCCC process. So the first two, which have to do with increasing current emissions and bringing more countries on board with their, uh, with their pledges, um, those must be seen uh, under the general agreement that developed countries should move up to the top of their pledge ranges. Currently, the gap, uh, and I don't know how this uh, uh, is, uh, compares to the science that you just heard, but uh, the numbers that we have seen, the gap is anywhere between six to 11 gigatons. Uh, and if countries were to move up to the top of their range, uh, that would help to close by around two to three gigatons. So not the final answer, but would certainly help. Um, and the other assumption is that developing countries do need the adequate support for them to move ahead and either increase their efforts or come on board if they haven't yet. The third, which is the recognition of the additional um, actions, involves national, regional, multilateral initiatives that, as I said, complement the UNFCC formal process but are not inside the process yet. And those, just to illustrate, are uh, strengthening cooperation on enhancing renewable energies, energy efficiency, transport emissions, which are under ICAO and IMO, phasing out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, where the G20 is taking the lead, um, and cooperation on addressing short-lived climate pollutants and HFCs that are also uh, being taken forward uh, by other venues. This does not mean that the UNFCC would take that over. This is not a, uh, a declaration of war and turf, uh, turf fighting. This is actually just to recognize that these are occurring in other, um, in other spaces and can actually contribute to, uh, to mitigation. And of course, markets um, has also been put forward by quite a few stakeholders uh, as one way to reduce the cost of mitigation and hence increase the level of mitigation. So all of this is encouraging, certainly, uh, but I am sure that you will agree that we need fast and concrete results. And here I would like to move to the private sector. Um, because it is clear to me that the private sector, at least some parts of the private sector, are beginning to align themselves. Question is, is it happening fast enough? Good policy is emerging at both the international and the uh, national levels, but the signal is frankly not strong enough to accelerate the clean energy revolution to the pace and scale that would be needed to reach the tipping point in a timely fashion. The private sector is getting aligned and uh, showing that the clean energy revolution has started. Let me give you a couple of examples. Renewable energy contributes now more to energy consumption growth than oil. 
in large part due to the dramatic reductions in clean energy costs over the past few years. Investment in clean energy may soon surpass investment in traditional fuels. In 2011, it hit a total of $1 trillion and continues to rise. Bloomberg recently published a very interesting article pointing to several trends on renewables, among which uh, is the important trend that now major industrial companies are actually taking the lead in clean energy markets and putting the full weight of their advanced capabilities in quality assurance, engineering, and investment planning behind renewables. And of course, more and more companies around the world are recognizing climate change as the biggest medium to both long-term risk and opportunity. They are disclosing and reducing their own carbon emissions, and they are designing mitigation and adaptation strategies because it fits their bottom line. So momentum for change is growing, but what is still missing to get us to the low carbon tipping point? Well, a long list. Fiscal, regulatory, and monetary policy coordination that sets climate firmly in the context of national economic and security planning. Clear policy frameworks in which business can and must act. You can't encourage high carbon emissions with one hand and low carbon with the other. New thinking on climate-related long-term financing that attracts more large institutional investors. Using public funds to de-risk and leverage private financing into developing world projects at utility scale. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, a much clearer carbon price signal. Good news is that as of 2013, we will have pricing schemes uh, in 33 countries and 18 subnational jurisdictions, covering probably a total of 20% of global emissions. A good start, not enough, but definitely a good start. Now, none of this erases the very important differences among countries. In fact, Creating the low carbon paradigm is perceived through different lenses depending on the status in which you are in, in your development. So the industrialized countries have to dramatically reduce their emissions while adjusting to their debt and their stressed demographics. The emerging powers need room to grow out of poverty in a balanced way to ensure future security of energy and resources without conflict. And the poorest and most vulnerable countries need to support, need the support to leverage technologies that already exist to be able to leapfrog into sustainable economies without environmental and budgetary burdens of the old growth model. Now the only way for all of them to achieve their goals is to use the evidence that we already have of climate change, not to fall into the despair of doom and gloom because that won't get us anywhere, but rather to accelerate the energy revolution to produce cleaner and more efficiently and to consume more consciously. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is actually the crux of my message today that the fact is the evidence of climate change is the alarm bell of an impending disaster, but the solutions to climate change conform the path toward future stability and healthy growth. And let me conclude by debunking two of my favorite myths. Myth number one, the path forward is either top-down, i.e. intergovernmental regulation, or a bottom-up exercise of domestic policies, business action, public engagement. Well, that fallacy is probably as simplistic as asserting that a large ship needs either the captain on the bridge or powerful motors down in the engine room. It's the same thing. <coughs> so to my friends in the policy world, I say the path forward is the result of concurrent, mutually reinforcing efforts that help us to spiral up toward the tipping point of transformation. And myth number two, 
the impetus for movement comes from the desire to save the planet. Well, frankly, much as my soul sings to the tune of Michael Jackson's Heal the World, to my friends in the environmental advocacy world, and I hope some of you are here, uh, I say the fact is the impetus for transformation comes from the growing realization of each country that it is in its own self-interest to use its own local clean energy sources to eliminate wasteful energy use in all its forms and of course in developing countries to provide access to clean energy to those who do not have it. So the impetus comes as we change our engagement from a you first, which we see too often, no you first, no you first. You know, they're all very polite with each other. You go through the door first. Well, frankly, we need to change the you first attitude to a first mover ingenuity. And as soon as we understand that far from being a burden, solving climate change is actually a compelling opportunity. And to all of you, if you don't fall into either of the two categories of being policy wonks or environmental advocates, and in fact, even if you do, let me ask you, what are you doing to accelerate the tipping point? What are you doing? Because the fact is, whether, I don't care what your day job, what your night job is, none of us are exempted from this, from this responsibility. And if we're not doing our absolute best to accelerate that tipping point, we are abdicating our responsibility and passing it on to the next generation. And that, my friends, is not acceptable. Thank you.